Everybody, Cashflow Chris here taking on. Yo, our what's show. up, everybody? Cashflow Chris here at our. What's up, everybody? Cashflow Chris is the best show. Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Leveling Up Book Club. Uh, we are on day three of Atomic Habits. We're actually going to be finishing up today. Um, boom, there's our book, Atomic Habits by James Clear. We're going through chapters 13 through 20 today. Uh, we've had two previous days. They are both uploaded on YouTube, so if you want to catch up and, uh, and see all three of those sections, um, go ahead back to YouTube and, uh, and, and watch those. This will also be uploaded there as well. Um, I really appreciate you guys showing up. Um, it's a lot more fun doing this with a lot, a lot of people because this is an interactive book club. We read the book together and then we interact and we talk about how we can implement this into our business because that's the whole point of this book club. It's for small business owners who want to grow their business. And so we read books that are implementable, books that you can actually take the steps necessary to uh, put that into your business. So we all need habits, right? In business and in life, we all need uh, good habits. So that's why when I read this one, this is one that I really, really wanted to uh, share with the group. Just it has so many great uh, tools. So let's see, let's add Michelle. Oops. And I will screen share and we will get started. It looks like we got a couple new people. So we'll get started from the beginning. All right, welcome to the book club. As you can see, we read books like Profit First, Building a Story Brand, Never Split the Difference, Dynamic Delegation. Like I just said, books to help us grow our business. Uh, before we start, uh, so this is most Fridays, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, Arizona time. Um, I highly recommend having an actual hard copy of the book. I, I love to read books. I love to, uh, sorry, to listen to books rather than read, uh, but I like to do both. So it's up to you though. Uh, we are going to be here live on Zoom and uh, it's definitely an interactive um, show up, do the work, no distractions. I appreciate you being here and I appreciate you making it a priority. So we already went over James Clear. Let me uh, actually escape out of here and we'll move up to chapter 13. How to stop procrastinating by using the two minute rule. I always push the wrong button. There we go. Get it together, Chris. Get it together. I know, man. <laughs> All right. Two minute rule. Habits are automatic choices that can be completed in just a few seconds, but it can shape the actions and conscious conscious decisions that you take uh, for that you take uh, that you take for minutes and hours afterwards. Decisive moments are moments in a day that deliver an outsized impact. They set the options available to your future self. Decisive moments are important because our choice during a decisive moment sets the trajectory for how we spend the next chunk of our time. Your options are constrained by what's available. They are sh uh, shaped by the first choice. So when you start a new habit, it should take less than two minutes to do. In the book, they talk a lot about it's more important to get to the gym than what you do at the gym when you're starting to start the habit. Um, a new habit should not feel like a challenge. The actions that follow can be challenging, but the first two minutes should be easy. All right, so the two minute rule. Uh, to figure out a gateway habit, map out your goals on a scale from very easy to very hard. At the beginning, focus on mastering the habit of showing up. Instead of trying to engineer a perfect habit from the start, do the easy thing in a more consistent basis. A habit must be established before it can be improved. You have to standardize before you can optimize. You can't improve a habit that doesn't exist. Oh, I like that, right? So you're, it's more important just to create the habit. It doesn't matter how, uh, how good the habit is. So what happens after you master the art of showing up? What you want is a gateway habit that naturally leads you down a more productive path 
So the first two minutes becomes a ritual at the beginning of a larger routine. We talked last week about, you know, stretching before your workout uh, gets you ready and prepared. Uh, the ritual is the ideal way to master a difficult skill. The more you ritualize the beginning of the process, the more likely you will get into a flow. Who cold calls here, right? You got to get your, your, your workspace set up, you know, have maybe have your scripts here, have your water, your, your coffee for energy. You have your lists. Um, later on, it's going to talk about automating. So Mojo can be such a great tool, right? Because it, it dials. Actually, taking, taking out the, the action of pushing the buttons and dialing makes it go that much faster, that much faster. If the two-minute rule feels forced, try this. Do it for two minutes and then stop. It's not a strategy for starting. It's the whole thing. Your habit can only last 120 seconds. Let's see here. So if the two minute, oh, we already talked about it. So do two minutes and stop. The secret is always to stay below the point of where it feels like work. The best way is to always stop when you, when you are going good. And uh, it's better to do less than you hoped than to do nothing at all. Does anybody feel me on this one? Showing up is the, uh, our mentor Jeff Fagan says, uh, showing up is 80% is of the battle. You know, once you get there, you've, uh, it's more likely than you're gonna be doing this. So they have a couple examples here. Very easy, a, a very easy thing to do is just to put on your running shoes. An easier thing is to walk for 10 minutes. And then, you know, you're gonna progress into walking uh, more steps, then you're gonna go be running, and then, you know, that's how you're building that habit. Any uh, thoughts on that? Anybody uh, do anything to help uh, build their, their, their habits? Who, who, who participates with this? Yeah, I do, Chris. Uh, just reading through this chapter again, or actually listening to it uh, while I was on my morning workout and I decided to wake up and put, to set that first intention. I was really stuck on, you know, what's that choice of the first thing I do in the day? I've heard it a thousand times, but you know, I never made it a habit. So I started dancing for like two minutes, right when I wake up, listening to my favorite songs. And it's just set the pace for me every morning. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but it, it really worked for me. So I'm gonna try and do that for uh, the next week. Or I'm not gonna try, but I am gonna do that for the next week. Awesome. My, uh, my phone, my alarm is a song, which is best day ever is the song that I play. And so like, that's what I wake up to every single day. So yeah, I love that you dance in the morning. That gets your energy going too. That's awesome. Elizabeth, did you have something? Yes. Um, my thing is I love to stay up late, whether it's reading or watching some mystery stuff, um, just to get my, clear my mind. And uh, so the habit I've been working on is going to bed earlier and actually writing in my gratitude journal before going to bed. So it's oh, two habits in one. Yeah, because I'm the way I've been doing it for, for quite some time is I journal at night doing the gratitude journal, but then I, I, then I, and I go off and I start reading or doing something else and then I go to sleep. So I was pushing back my time of going to bed, thus waking up later. I'm not a morning person. I will be the first one to admit, I just don't like waking up early, but I know that the earlier I wake up, the more I can get done. I can take advantage of the day. So I am practicing uh, writing in my gratitude journal before going to sleep. Have that be the last thing that I do. Put my phone away, go to sleep earlier, waking up earlier, and then also journaling, doing gratitude journal then to set the intention for the day and then get the day going. So uh, showing up is everything. Showing up for myself in this case, as far as giving myself that time before going to sleep so I can have restful sleep has yeah. been very helpful. Yeah, that's fantastic. And having it sitting there right there. And uh, so even if you write for a minute or 30 seconds, it, it, it's helping build that habit. And then yes. I love that you used habit stacking to where after I journal, I go to sleep. Right. And when you do your gratitude, I, I don't know. I, do you remember where you read that? Where who suggests that? Because it's getting so, all of the positive stuff in your brain. Yes. So I read Miracle Morning, but I read that a long time ago and I bought it again because I, I gifted it. I love to gift books. So I gifted the book. So I read it, read it again. But my friend Debbie Camacho Franco, I don't know if you know her, 
Chris. You may know her. So. She works a lot with uh, Corey Peterson. Uh, she's oh, a syndication. Okay. She does a lot of syndication. Uh, she's the one that got me started on it. It was exactly, I want to say, June of last year, like a year ago, was when she told me, you know what, Elizabeth? I highly recommend you start journaling, doing the gratitude journal. I'm like, what? Okay, so, so I'm like, but I like to be on social media before I go to bed. She's like, no, that's not good because you fill your mind up with a lot of negativity and a lot of just a lot of things. So, so give yourself that time. And it's been wonderful. I've been doing it for a year and the way I do it, and there's no wrong, wrong or right way of doing a gratitude journal, but in my gratitude journal, what I write is um, I'm grateful for even the things that haven't happened yet because you're visualizing them. You're, you're speaking them into existence and that is key, you know, that, that you're going to onboard two fantastic rock star acquisition agents and thankful that, that, that they're, they're here and that they're working on getting better, whatever it is, you know, um, even personal for your health or for your family. It's just uh, being grateful for the things that have happened and even the ones that you want to see uh, manifest in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else have anything on this topic on uh, just kind of getting started with the habit? Yeah, it's, um, there was something else that I've, I've read in the past and it kind of added added to this chapter is with like the procrastination. Cause I'm, yeah, I'm right. someone that procrastinates a lot, unfortunately. That's like kind of one of my downfalls is I've always pushed something to the last minute until I, I need it done. Um, and I've tried to figure out how to how to be more proactive, right? Um, if there's like a bigger project, there's always going to be tasks, especially in our business, that we don't like doing, right? But it's there's some things that have to get done. A huge thing to avoid procrastinating on it is doing – because I've always said, oh, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all at once. I'm just going to knock it all out. Well, the way that our brain works – is if we just get started on it, we just do a teeny bit, just just to open it up, you know, just to start writing one thing down. Um, then if, if we just leave it, our mind keeps going back to it. And it's like, I got to keep doing this. I got to do it again. I got to finish this now. So it's, that's the way to break the procrastination is, is definitely start in advance ahead of time, even if it's just one little thing. And then it just opens up the floodgates and just our, our brain or two, you know, 2 million year old brain just says you need to keep doing this. You need to keep going. So super. Uh, awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. That's great. Which kind of leads us into our next chapter. So why don't we uh, screen share again? That leads us into chapter 14, how to make good habits inevitable and bad habits impossible. So a commitment device is a choice that you make in the present that controls your actions in the future. The key is to change the task such that it requires more work to get out of a good habit than to get started on it. If you're feeling motivated to get in shape, schedule a yoga session and pay ahead of time. When the time comes to act, not only the only way to bail is to cancel the meeting, which requires effort and may cost money. So how to automate a habit and never think about it again. The best way to break a bad habit is to make it impractical to do so. Increase the friction until you don't even have the option to act. Some actions like installing a cash register pay off again and again. Uh, the one-time choices require a little bit of effort but upfront, but create increasing value over time. So here's a few examples. Um, buying a water filter to clean your uh, drinking water. Um, using smaller plates. We talked about this a, a couple weeks ago, I believe, you know, just if you're trying to lose weight, make it, have, uh, put your food on a smaller plate. Sleep. Elizabeth talks about the importance of sleep. When I finally spent money on a good mattress, that like changed my world. Uh, Cause we were always just on old lumpy mattresses. We bought a nice one and it, they're not, you know, they're like a thousand bucks. Uh, blackout curtains. We, uh, we've done that for sure. Remove the television from your bedroom. Maybe remove your phone from the bedroom. Yes. My wife's, uh, her phone like beams all night long and like it flashes on, it drives me nuts. Um, she says she, it doesn't bother her, but I'm sure it probably wakes her up. It, at least it takes her out of the REM sleep, I'm sure. Um, let's see, do we have another? So anybody have any other examples on this, on uh, one-time actions that lock in good habits? 
Let's see, what was the story? Uh, oh, no, the, the, the story he, he took off was the guy who wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame, how uh, he wasn't doing it, he wasn't doing it, he wasn't writing, and he had a deadline. And so he had his assistant, they, he gave away all of his clothes. <laughs> so all he had was a robe. So he couldn't leave his house, right? That's, that's one way to make sure you, that's causing friction, right? The friction is he doesn't have anything to wear. If it was easy for him to just get dressed and go out and leave, then he's going to do that. Uh, productivity, un unsubscribe from emails. You know, if you want to, if you want more time, uh, less, uh, less friction on that. Turn off notifications and mute group chats. How many people are uh, guilty of this? You're working, bing, bing, right? You just look, you look, and you lose, you lose uh, your attention. Uh, use email filters. Delete games and social media apps on your phone. Whenever my wife gets all anxiety and shit, I make her delete Facebook because that's where most of it comes from. If you don't have, you have to download it every single time. Or in the book, they talked about. Uh, he had his assistant change his password. And so he, to get into Facebook, he would have to call his assistant and have to get the new password. That, that causes friction. Anybody else have anything on that? No? I think we actually did a, a in the, um, the Monday meetings, Chris, uh -huh. is we haven't done it in a little while, but is holding people accountable and making it difficult on their end, right? So if I'm not going to do what I say that I'm going to do, I have to pay a hundred bucks to like the charity, but yeah. a charity that I don't like, or, you know, uh, you know, so some, something, something exactly. of that nature to where it's, it kind of puts you, puts you at ease to, um, <laughs> you know, motivate you even further. Yeah, absolutely. A couple of things we've used in our accountability group is like, uh, we have one Cardinal fan. Uh, if he didn't do this, cause and we don't do it right away. You know, it's, it's with tough love when, when he's gone a week and he didn't do it. Then the next week he didn't do it. Okay. Do you really want to do it? Yes. Okay. So next week you have to show up wearing a Seahawks Jersey, a nice one. You got to buy like the $140 Seahawks Jersey, right? Or if you're a Trump fan, you got to, you know, send, send a hundred bucks to the other candidate or whatever, or if because that's painful or you can do the other side well, on our 75 hard if you didn't do a day you had to pay 50 dollars to phoenix children's hospital so that's the, you know that's a good thing unfortunately i think people would rather not do something they hate than do something they like a lot more people uh right i don't know that's me i'd rather rather do that so all right let's go back technology yeah we talked about this uh, automating your life with technology. Each habit is, uh, we hand over to the authority of technology, frees up time and energy to pour into the next uh, stage of growth. When working in your favor, automation can make your good habits inevitable, your bad habits impossible. The ultimate way to lock in future behavior is to automate your habits. Now for me, the best way for me to automate a habit is to give it away to somebody else. Like you guys can see Jordan's here. If I want something done 100%, I, I task it to Jordan, you know, of course we pay him, but that's how, you know, so if you need, especially with business, if you have stuff that just absolutely 100% has to get done, give it away. Um, like marketing and, uh, and, you know, doing your daily, your, your daily marketing lead generation, you know, that's something to where. Maybe you should give that away if you're not doing it consistently because it's something that needs to happen every single day. I know I'm one that I'm way too busy to be doing that, which is crazy because lead gen is the most important part of our business. It's the most part, important part of every business. So automating it with technology and or people helps that out. Yeah. Anybody else have anything on that chapter or should we move forward? Uh, medicine, yeah, they talk about medicine, getting your prescriptions filled automatically and, and think about that as a business practice, right? So your CVS and your typical person, you know, they're not going to be every 30, right? But if you want to make money, you need to fill that thing every 30. So when they started, you know, sign up for our text messages, well, I know I see some, uh, pharmacies will just start delivering it to you. 
you like they because they want it to go out they want that auto that auto pay they will they want to make that money because there's a really good chance your 30 days uh prescription is going to go 40 days and then instead of doing it 12 times a year now you're doing it 10 times a year so they set up automatic things to remind you to pay them pretty smart uh, personal finance uh pulling pulling out of your paycheck that's the best way for people who get paychecks like have your employer just pull that cash out you don't even see it out of sight out of mind that's kind of paying yourself worth uh cooking uh, meal delivery services that takes away your decision too um productivity social media browsing can be cut off with a website blocker for your team right that's probably not a bad idea yeah so the inversion of the third law of behavior change is to make it difficult. A commitment device is a choice that uh, made in the present that locks in a better behavior in the future. And that's it. So now we've added a couple more. So we 3.5, automate your habits, invest in technology and one-time purchases that lock in future behavior. Uh, use the two minute rule, downscale your habits until you can, it can be done in a mi two minutes or less. Uh, master the decisive moment. That was that was last week. Optimize the small choices that deliver outsized impact. And then over here, how to break a bad habit. We talked about making it difficult. Number one, increase friction. Increase the number of steps between you and your bad habits. Oh, I love that. We didn't talk about this. I love the Dave Ramsey one. Um, if you have spending problems. Now, the smart people are going to memorize their numbers. But if you haven't memorized your credit card number, they tell you to put your credit cards in a cup of water and put it in the freezer. So if you want to <laughs> spend, you have to wait, set it out. You have to wait for that thing to melt. And by the time it melts, you're probably not going to want to buy it. And then also in this book, he talked about rewarding yourself. I think it's actually the next chapter, rewarding yourself with, uh, we want to eat more at home. So every time we don't go out to eat, we put $50 in our vacation budget. So, you know, it helps doing that and then uh use a commitment device uh, restrict your future choices that the ones that benefit you restrict it to the ones that benefit you and now we are moving on to the fourth law make it satisfying just like that cake that cake is so satisfying it just fucking tastes good how come vegetables don't taste good that's bullshit. <laughs> Only with butter. <laughs> and garlic. <laughs> Lots of it. Chapter 15, the cardinal rule of behavior change. We are more likely to repeat a behavior when the experience is satisfying. The cardinal rule of behavior change. What is rewarded is repeated. What is punished is avoided. Immediate return environments. Your action instantly delivers clear and immediate outcomes. That's our problem, right? We don't go to the gym and see our muscles, right? It takes time. <laughs> but uh, when we lay down and watch TV, it's instant gratification. We, you know, so delaying gratification is the theme of this chapter. Uh, delayed return environment. You work for years before your actions deliver the intended payoff. The human brain did not evolve for life in a delayed return environment. You value the present more than the future. With our bad habits, the immediate outcome usually feels good, but the ultimate outcome feels bad. With good habits, it's the reverse. The immediate outcome is, is unenjoyable, but the ultimate outcome feels good. Uh, lottery winners are a perfect thing, right? You win $10 million and you can take three now or 10 over 10 years and everybody takes the three. It's crazy. What is immediately rewarded is repeated. All right, we talked about that. If you're willing to wait for the rewards, you'll face less competition and often get a bigger payoff. At decisive moments, add a little bit of immediate pleasure to the habits that pay off in the long run and add a little bit of immediate pain to the ones that don't. The vital thing is getting a habit to, to stick is the way to feel successful even in a small way. To stay on track, you need immediate rewards. They keep you excited while the, delay, uh, while the delayed rewards accumulate in the background. Next, reinforcement. Tie your habits to an immediate re reward. 
uh, which makes it satisfying when you finish, thus increasing the rate of behavior. A good example, go work out with a good friend. First of all, you're gonna have someone that you're supposed to meet, so that's an accountability partner. But when you enjoy spending time with somebody, you're gonna to wanna to do it. Use reinforcement when dealing with habits of avoidance. Uh, whenever you resist temptation, give yourself an immediate reward. Uh, that's like the 50 bucks, right? When you don't go out, you, you pay yourself 50 bucks. This makes avoidance visible and do, makes doing nothing satisfying. Identity can become a reinforcer. The identity becomes the reinforcer. You do it because it's who you are and it feels good to me. So when I'm, in, when I'm ketoed up and it's been weeks and, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that keto burn and I don't even want carbs. And when, whenever we go to di dinner, do you want bread? It's no, I don't eat bread. But when I'm trying to get into it, when I am eating carbs, it's like, oh man, I wish they didn't have the, don't bring it out. I can't even see it. I can't even smell it, you know? So it's who you are. You know, you're someone who does this. You're not someone who does that. You know, if uh, it's easier to quit drinking, if you start saying, oh, I don't drink, that's just who I am. It's not, it's not, ooh, should I have one? Should I do this tonight? Should I, no, no I don't drink. So it's your identity. Anybody else have uh, comments or ideas on this one? That's a prime example of what I just uh, started doing, right? Because I was having... I think I was, we were talking about it and I was trying to, you know, get started again with the 75 hard. And the biggest thing for me, especially, I don't know, maybe because it's all the staying inside still, and, um, you know, it's just easier to drink. Right. Um, so I had to figure out a way to kind of stop myself from, from drinking. So now I identify myself that I won't, I won't drink by myself. Right. I'll, I mean, I'm not going to ever, because if we want to have habits, sustainable habits over a lifetime. I'm not, I'm going to be realistic. I'm not going to give up drinking, right? I'm, I still want to drink, but I want to figure something out that's still beneficial for me in the long run, something that I can actually identify myself as, right? So shit tonight on a Friday, I would go buy a 12 pack and I'd be drinking that. I'd drink like half of that tonight, then kill the rest of it this weekend. But I identify myself now as somebody that only drinks socially with somebody else. If, if they're drinking, I'll, I'll drink, you know, I'll, I'll allow it. But so I think that's made a huge impact so far as just identifying yourself as, as something that you can actually stick to long-term. Nice. Michael, do you have something? Um, yeah. I mean, I'll kind of just piggyback off of that. For me, it was um, quite the opposite. So before all this quarantine um, started happening, I was just, I just figured, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a drinker. But in reality, it was more of a social environment. Like I would only drink when I was around other people. It's just the people that I was around would always drink. And it wasn't until like just being able to take a step back and realizing that. And, um, you know, along with other habits as well. Um, but just being able to identify myself as like, you know, I don't I don't need to drink to have fun. I'm just I am I'm a social drinker, if that now. Um yeah. I mean, so now I think I'm more of like, oh, I'm just a person that doesn't drink. <laughs> but it's just it's weird because that was so a part of, um, I don't know if it was a part of my identity or just the identity of the people that I was associating myself with. Yeah. So. And then again, when you go out with your friends, it's not a, it's not a decision. Mm -hmm. Like they don't even ask you. Once they know, once it becomes a habit and you're not a drinker, well, they're not even asking for a drink because you don't drink. Why would they ask you, right? Why would you even think about getting a drink if you don't drink? I, like I mean, there's it. gonna be, there's definitely gonna be some peer pressure there, but you know, like, oh, <laughs> what happened? What happened? You changed. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, it is what it is. So you can stack a habit on top of it and saying, you know what? I work out at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. You know, and I don't want to drink. I'll feel like shit. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like shit on the workout. So. Yeah, that's that's kind of um that's kind of what I say already, but I mean maybe my wording needs to be a little uh different <laughs> a right. little more acceptable to everyone else oh it's like man you're crazy i don't even drink i gotta get up in seven hours you guys are nuts. <laughs> yeah, anybody else got, got an example or should we move on um you know what why don't we back up just a hair 
has anybody does anybody have a good example of making something satisfying making where uh we are more likely to repeat a behavior when the experience is satisfying i got a good one chris what's um, that me is uh for riding my bike i love to work out and when i don't work out you know so many negative effects that we all know so i really try and make it a daily habit and the most time that i have is usually in the beginning of the day so what i did was i got my bike tuned up and so i've been riding again on my road bike and crushing about 40 miles a trip and uh you know the first couple of days it was like you know six miles you know seven miles but as soon as i got done i cooked myself uh something delicious you know so immediately i think about oh hey i gotta hurry up and finish this ride like no matter where i'm at you know haul ass and get back home because i gotta eat before i go out so it kind of held me accountable but i started seeing a lot more beneficial rewards and then i also posted on social media hey just had a good ride you know with an app so that's been, been helping me keep that habit of riding because you're a bike rider that's what you do i like it anybody else all right, all right. Chapter 16 talks about how to stick with good habits every single day. So visual measures reinforce your behavior. Oh, I like this challenge, uh, this uh, chapter, this is a good one. Uh, add a little bit of immediate satisfaction to any activity, a habit tracker, a simple way to measure whether you did a habit a basic format is to get a calendar. Yeah, yeah, so here's a couple of examples. Um, the, in the book, they talked about the guy who uh, had paper clips, right? He had a 125 paper clips. As soon as he made a call, he would put it over, put it over. So you see where you're, you're going, you're, you're, you're making changes. And then at the end, you see that you put your work in. Um, habit tr tracking simultaneously makes a behavior obvious, attractive, and satisfying. Habit tracking is obvious. Uh, record your, recording your last action creates a trigger that can initiate your next one. The mere act of tracking a behavior can spark the urge to change it. Measurement offers one way to overcome your blindness to our own behavior and notice what's going on each day. Habit tracking is attractive. The most effective form of motivation is progress. Through habit tracking, each small win feel, feeds your desire. And then lastly, it's satisfying. It can be its own form of reward like that mark on the calendar, right? If you wanna, if you, uh, you know, I wanna run every day and then you put that big X over it, seeing that, you know, hanging that calendar on, you, on your wall and seeing that, that, seeing all those X's, that's extremely satisfying. Habit tracking provides visual proof that you are casting votes for the type of person you wish to become, which is a delightful form of immediate and intrinsic gratification. So how to make it easier. Whenever possible, it should be automated. Um, my fitness pal, right? If you're tracking your food, if you're trying to do a diet or exercise, you know, tracking it and looking at it every single day and, and entering in your journal is, is huge. Uh, manual tracking should be limited to the most important habits. It's better to consistently track one habit than to sporadically track 10. Record each measurement immediately after a habit occurs. The completion of that behavior is the cue to write it down. So the habit stacking plus habit tracking formula is after current habit, I will track my habit. So after JT goes on his bike ride, he will write down the mileage. Um, every habit streak ends at some point. Have a good plan for when your habits slide off track. Perfection is being consistent with your habits. It is. Uh, is not possible. So never miss twice. That's one thing with a lot of guys who do the 75 hard that I didn't like is they, if they missed a day, they like quit. They failed. Well, 70 out of 75 days is still pretty good. You know, you shouldn't just go four days and you missed day five. So you quit, but try to get back on day six. Anybody have any uh, thoughts on this chapter? After 17, we talk about getting accountability partners. We'll kind of go a little bit through this. Um, the habit contract they talked about, you know, actually literally writing it down. When we did our 75 hard, that's what we did. We had a contract that we signed telling what we would do, what we wouldn't do. 
Um, and then, and then we had a thread, a, uh, a text thread. And so every single day, every single one of us had to show us in the, in the gym once and outside once working out. Um, we, we, we did the honor sister on everything, honor system on everything else, but we definitely had to take those pictures. Okay. So that takes us to the end of part four. Make it satisfying. Use reinforcement. Give yourself an immediate reward when you complete your habit. Make doing nothing enjoyable. When avoiding a bad habit, design a way to see the benefits. 4.3 was use a habit tracker. 4.4, never miss twice. And then on the how to breaking a bad habit, 4.5, get an accountability partner. Ask someone to watch your behavior. 4.6, create a habit contract. Make the cost of your bad habit public and painful. Put it on Facebook. People on Facebook are plenty judgmental. We'll hold you accountable. <laughs> Anybody have anything on that? Or do we move on? This is all good stuff, but it's kind of just like wrapping up and a lot of stuff that we've kind of already talked about. All right, so chapter 18, the truth about talent. This was a interesting story about Michael Phelps and the runner, Hicham L something. The guy from uh, Morocco. So they had the same inseam. So uh, the dude, the small guy, the runner was, how big was he? He's he was only like short. five eight. Yeah, he was short. He was like five six, five seven, And then Michael Phelps, of course, we know is six four. But they have the same inseam. So Michael's got a huge torso, really long arms, which is perfect for swimming. And the other guy, even though he's really short, he's got really long legs. He doesn't weigh much. He only weighs like 138 pounds. And so their genetics, you know, Michael wouldn't be a world-class runner and this other guy wouldn't be a world-class swimmer just because their bodies aren't, aren't done that way. Uh, the secret to maximizing your odds of success is to choose the right field of competition. Embracing this strategy requires the acceptance of the simple truth that people are born with different abilities. Competence is highly dependent on context. The people at the top of any competitive field are not only well-trained, they're also well-suited to the task. And this is why, if you want to truly be great, selecting the right place uh, to focus is critical. Where do I figure that the odds are in my favor? Uh, I was watching an interview, one of my, my favorite 49ers uh, defensive linemen was talking about how, yeah, if I wasn't, you know, dude is like 6'8", 3'10" he couldn't do his job if he was 5'8", 130, right? I mean, it's, you have to be gifted uh, physically sometimes. Um, let's see. If you're currently winning, you exploit, exploit, exploit. If you're currently losing, you continue to explore, explore. Uh, yeah, this was a really good part of it. They talked about working on your 80 to 90% strategy. So especially in business and life, you know, if something's going well, uh, keep it, keep at the habits, you know, you want to keep 80, 90%, but don't worry about, or don't, you should definitely look at developing yourself and changing some ideas. Let's see, we got a chat. What do we got? Somebody chatted, let me pull it up. Why is it not letting me pull it up? Somebody, what's that chat say? Oh, I was just saying, me. Jordan, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. I was just like reading. Oh, okay. Um, ask yourself, what makes, what feels like fun to me, but work to others? What makes me lose track of time? Where do I get greater returns than the average person? What comes naturally to me? Um, when you can't win by being better, you can win by being different. I was talking to my buddy Charles out in Cleveland this week. Um, he's trying to get his daughter into golf. Cause he's like, she's not very fast. <laughs> she's not very athletic. So golf is a good one. And my niece, she, uh, my niece is not a really particularly like thin little girl, you know, she's big and strong. And so when my sister made all her kids join track, 
she did shot put. And well, there's not many 13, 14, 15 year old little girls who were doing shot put. So it helped that she got good. She was physically uh, gifted in that area, but there's a lot less competition. So she got, um, she got scholarships because there's not much competition in that, right? So be good at it because, you know, she was good at it because of her size and strength. And then uh, she, she took advantage of it. Even though you're not the most naturally gifted, you can often win by being the best in a very narrow category. Genes can't make you successful if you're not doing the work, though. Action is always going to be key. Anybody got any thoughts on that chapter? What are you guys physically gifted at? What are you great at? that nobody that you know it's just like i'm just naturally better like math like some people just are great at math anybody time to brag about yourself what do you guys do well i'm really good at picking up on um like grammar and writing so i'm not very good at math okay never have been um, maybe one day i will dominate it but reading it's like when someone makes a mistake, a uh, grammatical mistake or anything with, with spelling, it kind of like pops out at me and I just pick up on it very easily. So I'm really good at proofreading things and making sure the copy is, is correct. Anybody else? What are, you, what are you good at? What are you just naturally good at? I'm good at numbers. Um, yeah. I'm always good at like just uh, forming numbers, um, just adding things up, just, you know, numbers, not like a math whiz or anything. Um, and I'm like good at, yeah, I'm good at reaching things on top of the fridge. Six foot yeah, three. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love being tall. I love yeah. uh, uh, being tall. Yes. That was one of the things like basketball, right? Um, for, you know, if, if I wasn't 6'4", I might not have been on the basketball team in high school, you know? Um, what else? Jordan, what are you great at? Cleaning up things. I guess that's what made me one of the successful, a successful VA. Uh, I like, you know, organizing files, um, following up to people. So Organization, that's a big one. Like my sister-in-law is one of those people, like she'll come and everything will have its place. Me, I don't even think about that. It's just, when I don't know, when I was a kid, my room was always a mess. But every time my mom came and cleaned it up, I'm like, <laughs> where's that? Like I knew what I needed was under that pile of clothes, right? <laughs> You're like my wife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, it's an organized mess. But as True. soon as you clean it, now I don't know where anything is. <laughs> All right, you know, uh, let's move forward we're almost done here chapter 19 the goldilocks rule there we go this one's just right the goldilocks rule I'm sure is on this slide the way to maintain motivation and to achieve peak level of desire is to work on tasks that are just manageable difficulty the Goldilocks rule. Uh, humans experience peak motivation when working on tasks that are right on the edge of their current abilities. Not too hard, not too easy, just right. How to stay focused when you get bored working on your goals. At some point it comes down to who can handle the boredom of training every day, doing the same lifts over and over and over. The greatest bet to successful is not failure, but boredom. This is so, so, so true. All my so all my small business owner friends that I, I see this, it's, we get bored. I see this with realtors all the time. They <laughs> do something, they do something. We have uh, Eric in our group. He, uh, he made a commitment to make like, I don't know, like 50 calls a day or a week or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And at the end, like, what were your results? Oh, I got three buyers. I got a listing, blah, blah, blah. And then the next week, did you make your call? No. Because it's boring. It's boring do that, doing that week in, week out. But you got to do that sometimes. Success is boring. Variable rewards. The sweet spot of desire occurs at a 50-50 split between success and failure. Re variable rewards or not, no habit will stay interesting forever. Professionals stick to the schedule. Amateurs let life get in the way. When a habit is truly important to you, you, will, you have to be willing to stick to it at any mood. So even though it's hot out, JT's got to get out there, even though he feels like a 
being lazy, laying on the couch, he's got to get out and get on that bike. The only way to become excellent is to become endlessly fascinated by doing the same thing over and over. You have to fall in love with boredom. Anybody uh, relate to this one? Cold calling. What's that? Cold calling. You're cold calling right there. Again, by using that technology, uh, just shit, it's ringing, you know? <laughs> as soon as you hang up, it's ringing. As soon as you hang up, it's ringing. So yeah, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. what else what else is something that you just if you just do it every day you're going to be super successful i mean the gym right doing those reps doing uh it's simple right what would our bodies look like if we did 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups every day all of us right we would, so we would look great it's simple all you gotta do is roll out of bed do 100 sit-ups 100 push-ups every single day every single day every single day why don't we do it yeah. <laughs> you ask the uh the bodybuilders is like what's your diet and they're like well it's a uh, chicken and rice three meals a day on you know and then a protein shake in the morning protein shake in the evening it's like damn yeah. like, he can't how many people could do that <laughs> you know, do sick you, with it. does anybody uh so raise your hand if you know it's always sunny in philadelphia okay so mac went from normal to ripped ripped the fat back to ripped. I saw an interview of him and he's there like, how did you get ripped? He's like, oh my God, it's so easy. Anybody can do it. Well, the first thing you gotta do is hire this world-class uh, this world-class trainer. Secondly, you have to stop eating food. You know, third, so it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, anybody can do it, but man, you gotta put those reps in and you gotta have the uh, system around you as well. All right, let's wrap this baby up. Chapter 20. The downside of creating good habits. What? How could, how could there be a downside? The downside is that you get used to doing things a certain way and stop paying attention. Boom. This is this kind of ties back into the 80, 90 percent uh, or the 80, 20, right? So habits plus deliberate practice equal mastery. Habits are necessary, but not sufficient for mastery. You need a combination of automatic habits and deliberate practice to become exceptional. Uh, because we've always done it that way, it doesn't mean it's the right way. Yeah. Uh, the process of mastery, narrow your focus to a tiny element of success. Repeat until you have internalized the skill. Use this new habit as a foundation to advance to the next frontier of your development. The process of mastery requires that you progressively layer improvements on top of each other. Each habit building upon the last until a new level of performance has been reached and a higher range of skills has been internalized. Let's see here. To avoid complacency, make, uh, to make you aware of where to improve and to ensure that you're spending your time on the right things, establish a system for reflection and review, which doesn't have to be complex. Uh, so they ha he has a couple of reviews. He has an annual review. What went well this year? What didn't go well? And he has an integrity report. He talked a lot about this. What are his core values that drive it? And then is he living with that? I highly recommend living the best year ever journal for this. This journal right here. Because um, that's, it's a weekly review. It's a daily, weekly, quarterly, uh, biannually, and an annual review. As you latch onto a new identity, that identity can also hold you back from the next level of growth. Your identity creates pride that encourages you to deny your weak spots and prevents you from growing. Uh, this is, I see a lot of this with us in the real estate game. Like I started 15 years ago, letters worked. Like a lot of stuff worked and there's a lot of new technology that comes. And if you're stuck in your old ways, I mean, think about it. We were, uh, we were sending letters and we were doing everything slow when today you could go text blast somebody 2000 people right now and just do it like the whole list the whole list that you used to spend a quarter on can you can actually hit them one time boom instantly um, 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 um let's see life is consistently changing so you need to periodically check in to see if your old habits and beliefs are still serving you huh. that's it we have other programs of course guys uh, we have the Leveling Up Mastermind Group. Um, 
we, you are in the book, book club. Um, if you're not following on IG, definitely do that as well. Uh, we have services. So if you guys need to be outsourcing some of your habits and stuff that needs to get done, reach out to myself or Jordan. Uh, we can get you hooked up with a VA or two or 10 like us. And I think that's about it. Yep. Um, so let's talk about our next book. Let me pull it up so everybody can see it in the video. Mm. Aren't we having a raffle this month? Um, uh, we haven't had one yet. You will though. Maya, why don't you set up a, let's for the next week, let's, uh, let's advertise and get people in and yeah, let's give away, give away a book, whatever you guys want. So here is our next book, Limitless, Upgrade Your Brain. Let's see what it looks like on Amazon. Man, my computer's slow. So you can buy it used. Wow, why is it so much used? So 16 bucks, Prime, it'll be there tomorrow. So I will order this. I'm also going to have it on. Uh, I'm going to listen to it as well. And uh, we will. We'll just have an intro next Friday and we'll make assignments for how many chapters that we'll do the, the week after that. Anybody got any questions? Well, no. thanks again, guys. It's so much better with everybody here participating. You help me. Uh, you helped me grow my business. I really appreciate it. So, um, go get limitless and tell all your friends about the book club and let's, uh, let's definitely grow this thing. Lastly, if you would like to teach book club, I would love that. If you want to do the July book of the month, I would love that. If you, you know, if that's something you would like to do, uh, Maya will help you with the slideshow. So we'll, we'll provide the slideshow for you but I would love someone else to take this and run as well because it's, uh, it's boring having the same guy over and over again. So, <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed weekend and week.